Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Valley Transportation. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransinc.com for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is also brought to you by AgDirect. No matter how you buy your ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Moving Iron. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs at Valley Transportation. Our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online to agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida, and he's nice enough to come on a couple times a week to talk about what's going on in the market. So, Sean, how you doing this morning? Doing really good. We've uh, we got some hot markets here. Uh, this uh, melt-up phase we talked about uh, earlier in the week seems to be uh, unfolding here, and um, things are really rocking and rolling in that markets right now. Yep. So, yeah, things are. Uh, we had a WAS report come out yesterday, and uh, there was, I don't know, I guess in your opinion, Sean, how would you label that? Was it what you expected, or about what you, or did you see some some highlights there? I mean, usually there's not, it's not a a big report for major changes and there wasn't, you know, if if, if anything popped up, they did knock down U.S. soybean ending stocks, some that certainly as bullish as the market is, as worried as the market is over South American weather, you know, to to even knock down ending stocks at all, you know, keeps the bullish trend going. But for the most part, what I think it did do, it, it didn't provide any bearish news. And so the trend is your friend. Until it's not. So I think the market took the report. It paused for a second and said, we don't see anything to change our mind. We're still worried about South America. And then the market's powered ahead, you know, about, you know, half hour after the report got released. And, you know, soybeans tonight, make, uh, this morning, making new highs again. So um, overall, you know, I'd expect much bigger um, reports coming up here in the planting and tensions report at the end of March and the Corley grain stocks at the end of March. Those tend to be some really big market movers. So uh, I would brace for those reports to be something more impactful than this one was. Right on. Yesterday, China had some news that came out talking a little bit about their intentions for um, for cotton over the next year, that they were dramatically going to buy less cotton than they bought in uh, uh, in 20 over the last, basically the last six months, basically what they're saying. Um, obviously, China's one of those, uh, wait, see what they do, before, don't really listen to what they say types. But, you know, you saw the market yesterday in cotton take a take a fairly big hit. I think it was down seventy nine points or something like that, something along those lines. Um, but I guess as you as you take a look at at that kind of rhetoric coming out of China, um, you've talked about it a little bit on here before. Do you feel like that more solidifies what you've talked about, or do you are you still kind of in that wait and see mode? Well, I, I mean, I agree with their assessment. I mean, I, I believe their exports are going to be way off. I believe they stockpiled a lot. Um, I believe the, ec- the economy uh, in China is in uh, you know, pretty severe slowdown due to the uh, real estate problems they're having over there, plus the extreme you know, no tolerance policy for COVID that continues to lock down 15, 20 million people at a time. Um, and so I think you know, that's part of our thesis. We talked about this, Casey, that you know, their exports would likely start to fall off and if we get those acres planted, that the current price level is definitely encouraging. And with any kind of good weather at all, 
we're going to have a considerable amount of extra wheat lying around a year from now than today, which really makes you know the, the possibility that the prices we're setting now, not only for the old crop, but for the new crop, you know, it could be pretty pr- pretty good price highs for the rest of the year unless we got a really really uh, impactful uh, you know weather shock sometime over the summer. Yep. Okay. Let's jump over and let's hit a couple other things real quick. The dairy market again. We talk about that uh, on Thursdays, and as, as you look what's going on there, there's still been some very stable movement there. I mean, it's it's holding the line there at that that twenty plus to twenty one range, pretty regular. As you look what's going on there. Um, Still seems demand seems to be there, and you still seeing some some record prices out there for for dairy right now. The biggest problem for dairy right now is no one's growing production. KC, I mean, uh, you know, we're flattened down. Europe's flattened down. New Zealand's down. Um, so even if even if demand softens some, you know, it's very very unusual for global production to be down for any extended period of time. Um, at the same time, we're looking at milk prices domestically in China that still remain near all-time highs or close to it, um, and that that means they're buying a lot of milk powder. That's what they like buying a lot of um, milk powder, and they have been buying a lot of milk powder. So uh, we were flirting with all-time new highs in class three milk and class four milk for the second quarter. Um, so, you know, you, you know how chart patterns work, Casey. Either this is a reason for the market to correct or this is a reason for the market to just blast off. Um, you know, we, we've had a $30 forecast on class three and class four prices that we made a year and a half ago that we thought would, ha- we thought would happen later on in uh, 2022. It's possible, given the way things are playing out with markets, that you know, maybe, maybe we're just going to do it right now. We're not totally sure about that yet other than to say that prices are quite a bit stronger for longer than we thought they would be so i guess my point is we remain bullish this market it's just a question of do can we get a setback now or um, or are we just going to get to put the full price increase now and we'll soon find out markets don't tend to stay right around all-time highs they either blow through them or they correct and so that's where we're at and so we'll have to just monitor that we'll look at our smart money algorithm, you know, a lot of our uh, technical work, relative value work to see if we can get a, a better handle on what, how this pathway is going to go. But definitely a bullish time and dairies are making some money finally. Yeah. So. so let's talk about sugar for a little bit. So sugar price was up there around um, 20 cents or so. Um, <clears throat> right coming in towards the end of the year. And as you take a look what's happening now, there's been a slow erosion of the sugar price down to 18, about 18 cents right now. You talked about that a little bit at the, uh, in that September, October timeframe that, you know, as some other supplies came online via, you know, the Indian and, uh, the Southeast Asia, um, uh, sugar cane crops started to come to market. You would start seeing some erosion there. We're starting to see that now. Do you feel like sugars hit a bottom or do you still see some further slide there? I think most of the, uh, surplus supply that was coming from Asia, India, and Thailand that we talked about um, has has impacted the market. Right now, where crude oil prices are, um, the need for more ethanol consumption, you know, obviously sugar is an important input for producing ethanol in Brazil. Uh, We saw uh, a press release uh, in India that they're going to be diverting record amounts of sugar to produce ethanol in India. Um, So that will remove some of the exportable supplies that they would have had otherwise. So, so long as crude oil, you know, stays strong, we think the ethanol demand pull story is going to, is going to keep this market from going much lower. Remember, sugar production is greatly impacted by El Nino, meaning production is negatively impacted in Asia by El Nino. If you look at some of the bigger moves higher in sugar over the last 25 years is when you can go from a La Nina to an El Nino, they, you've t- you tend to see big price rises in sugar. That's not today, but we're very confident that we're moving towards an El Nino you know, later this year. And so we think that uh, sugar prices are, are likely to kind of develop a bottoming pattern here into the spring. And then I think we start turning our uh, price level here up over the summer as we start to worry about El Nino. And we start to see some of these drier, uh, hot, drier patterns in Asia develop and the market starts to worry that those supplies are going to be down just as this 
demand for ethanol continues to crank. So we're we're feeling most of the, uh, of the bearishness is, is is priced in, and now uh, but we still think it's too early to expect too much of the upside. The wild card, something we've talked about on your uh, past podcast, is the Brazilian real. You know, the Brazilian real has been strengthening, and sugar is a, is definitely a big exportable market for Brazil. And so, if the Brazilian real were to really break out over that twenty mark that we keep talking about as a confirmation that the real's really turned up. That could set the sugar market into a higher price level earlier than we're thinking. So that's the one thing that might uh, turn the sugar market up sooner. Absent that, we think uh, we're looking for a bullish turning point over the, over the springtime. So okay, so energy. Let's talk about that a little bit. You brought that up, and we were talking about ethanol, and that was a couple things I wanted to hit on. If you look at soybean crush, and you look at uh, ethanol crush uh, with corn, and you start taking into effect that right now. Um, this morning oil is trading, uh, about 90, 90 and a half and Brent's right around, uh, 92, a little over 92, uh, broke above that 90 mark here about a week or so ago. And it's kind of stayed there. Hasn't really shown any signs of going backwards on that inflationary driven, obviously. But as you take a look at all that stuff and how those things fold together, that soybean crush is going to keep driving these, these soybean markets that you see out there. So I guess talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, for, for sure. I mean, we every single month, record crush, record crush, record crush, record crush in the U.S. Uh, unstoppable for this renewable diesel, you know, producing more bean oil from, from renewable diesel. We know that the palm oil exports out of Indonesia, you know, are have been, uh, um, they've put limitations on it because they're trying to keep more of the palm oil in-house because they've had a, a short crop due to some excessive wetness over the uh, fall of last year. And so, so when you look at vegetable oil stocks, all vegetable oils, Casey, I'm talking about canola oil, bean oil, palm oil, throw any other oil you want on there. When you look at the whole mix to, of vegetable oil to stocks ratio, we are sitting at 25 year lows and we're just starting up this gold rush for U S based renewable diesel. Very, very hard to see how the soybean crush in the U.S. is going to be anything but record-setting. Um, now, of course, we can produce a lot of soybeans, and that doesn't mean it has to be bullish always for soybeans, but that is a demand-driven story like ethanol was for corn 15 years ago. And we had better get more acres planted this spring, Casey, and we had better have good yields given that South America is going to come up short. We have no room. For anything but maximum acres, maximum yield in the U.S. to put this genie back in the bottle. Already 16, 20 something today in the nearby soybean contract. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what the all time high is 17 something, but you know, we're not far away from you know all time high. So this market is really pricing in the worry of the Herculean the Herculean uh, uh, effort that has to take place to keep this market from running out of soybeans. So, okay. Well, yeah, there's a lot of, that's a big deal too, because as much as there is this push towards biodiesel, I mean, biodiesel's kind of been there, but here of late, you really hear a lot more about biodiesel than you've heard. I've heard about then, you know, looking back on the whole ethanol boom, biodiesel was just kind of that, third wheel almost out there that people talked about and here of late now with you start looking at, at airline fuel and, and those kind of things biodiesel is getting to be a bigger part of that picture well what's really different is it looks to me like there, this is going to be a major transportation fuel like it's going to be the the, the idea is that they they want this to replace heating oil diesel regular diesel right and that is a huge amount of demand a huge amount of supply that needs to be produced. That's very different than, you know, what we were dealing with, you know, the, the biodiesel craze in the past. It was never really meant to be a transportation replacement fuel. Now it's, 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 it's wanting to be that. And if it's going to be that you run the numbers, Casey, about how many acres of soybeans you need to plant, what kind of yields you need to have, what kind of, 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 um, quality you need yeah. to have in order to produce the yield yeah. on the oil that you need. You, you know, we just haven't been down this road before. It, it, like I said, it's 2002, 2004 gold rush and ethanol where we, we knew something big was happening. We didn't know 
all the rules yet or how it was going to turn out, but we knew that the demand was going to be pretty insane for a while. And we're at that point where we just set, we're resetting the rules of supply and demand, like, because we've never seen this before. So uh, I think the soy market is recognizing it needs to be at a different price level uh, until it can figure out exactly what the nature of this new uh, set of rules that we're trying to develop. And, uh, and that means that, like I said, every single issue with production, anywhere in the world is going to be viewed with a very sensitive micro, you know, uh, microscope. And there can be nothing but perfection right now in the mind of the market. We can already see just small little changes in the USDA's ending stocks from three, what was it? Three, 50 to 325, I think it was. I mean, just, you know, it's a, and the market was like, couldn't handle it. Yeah. So uh, that's where we're at. And, and by the way, the more acres that soybeans are uh, attract with these higher prices, some of those acres are going to come from corn in the fringe acres. That's for sure. Um, and that means bullish for corn. You know, I mean, that less acres for corn, less production for corn. You know, it's really bullish the grain markets. <laughs> right. You know, it's a it's a bullish grain market story. One leads to the other, leads to the other. You know, how, you know, will we lose? You know, wheat acres over this. I mean, it really is a situation where the more acres those soybeans are going to be attracting away from other crops, it just makes the whole ag space, you know, really, really uh, harder to manage supply and demand because we just don't have those easily shuffable acres like we've been accustomed to you know over the last 10 years and remember soybean is a big big global crop and what what go what happens in soybeans doesn't stay in soybeans right so yep good point all right let's follow back up on orange juice real quick post the uh the freeze i had in in the florida citrus belt right now as you look at what's going on there Looks like orange juice has made some some run ups, but I guess as you take a look, what's going on there? Are you seeing the impacts that you thought you'd see post this freeze? Well, first I, I like to go over the psychology of a frost. Okay. Um, what happens with the frost? It's, it's, it's these fantastical events. You see these weather maps. You see these you know pictures and and and, and all these very very fast trading, short term trading, speculative funds, analogs get all rushing in for this day or two that's going to ruin the crop. Mm -hmm. And they come rushing in. Now, remember, the majority of frost on tree crops isn't see, you know, you, you can't see it with your eyes. It's hidden damage inside the tree that shows up when the, when the tree tries to flower on the next crop cycle and the flowering. So, so, so go back to the coffee, the second coffee frost, in Brazil in late July. The market got absolutely obliterated. Went from $2.15 down to $1.68. Um, and the frost was massively bad. It was, it, was, it was worse than it was supposed to be, but they they couldn't see that there was any like they couldn't see more than what. Mm -hmm. and, and so they said, well, everything's fine. And then, of course, we came into the flowering case, as you know, in the fall, we were there. I was there mm -hmm. and actually did a crop tour and looked in and the flowering did not deliver any fruit. The tree was damaged. It was tired. It was bludgeoned. And instead of producing coffee cherries, it was producing leaves and branch growth. And that's where your damage showed up. And then, of course, now the coffee market made new highs yesterday um, at 258, the highest levels in 15 years. So, uh so, 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 so the answer, so, so that's the psychology of a frost. So the same thing with orange, the orange crop, you can't see it. Yeah. You can see a little bit. Oh, it, it's fine. Our work, our analysis um, on the frost was that it was a worse frost than it was supposed to be. It was widespread mm -hmm. um, and real material damage. Absolutely. In our view was definitely done and it will show up in a very poor flowering blooming season coming up in the next crop cycle, which means we're going to have a lot less fruit that get produced on the trees. And because the trees are going to be, um, you know, they're, they're, they're weakened that those, the fruit size is going to be smaller. So less fruit, less fruit size means a heck of a lot less orange juice production than we produced this year. So we think that the market has 
done this. We call it the rope a dope. Mm -hmm. You you run it up and then you crash it. Well, we've seen the crash, and now the market's starting to stabilize. We're starting to move back up, and we think that uh, if you look at the pattern of coffee, I think the orange juice pattern is going to be follow a pretty similar pattern where it kind of kind of works its way, it stabilizes at bottoms, and then all of a sudden it starts to recognize that we actually do have a problem. The force actually delivered. Oh my gosh. We actually need to get this market to new highs again. And so we're pretty constructive on the market now that we've gotten this, you know, yin yang frost rope of dope out of the way. So. Right, on. right on. Well, good stuff as usual, Sean. If folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing at Hackett Financial, what's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H A C K E T T, advisors.com. We have podcasts, we have white papers, sample reports, we have interviews with you to get everyone an idea of what we do, how we think, and to think and to see if some of our information could be of value to your listeners. Right on. Well, Sean, I appreciate you being on the podcast, man. Thanks, Casey. Always glad to be here. Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's where you find the latest editions of the Moving Iron Podcast. Also, go to movingironllc.com for all the latest editions of the Moving Iron Podcast, blogs, and also information about the Moving Iron Summit coming up here in Nashville, Tennessee. That's September 6th, 7th, and 8th. And uh, those will be listed. Um, all the information is listed there. So if you need more information, though, and, and you have a finite question, give me a call at, at uh, or shoot me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at movingironpodcast.com, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So with that, I am Casey Seymour, Sean Hackett. Let's go move some iron, folks. Out. Axon Tire is going to have more tips, tricks, and client advice throughout the year and in September at the Moving Iron Summit in Nashville. If you're looking to sign up for the event, please head over to movingironllc.com. We hope to see you there. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransitinc.com for all of your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving higher in the 21st century